Hello, and thank you for joining us today. Hope everybody's doing wonderful. My name is Matt Bennett. I work in the sales department, and I am super happy to be talking to you at Winter Conference 2021. Hey, our conversation today, the title is going to be Depth from the Driver's Seat. We're going to explore the issue of depth control on a planner, what's right, what are the obstacles, what can we do to get better. Not only are you going to have to listen to me, but you also get to listen. We'll have Jason, Jason Webster give us PTI plot results. We'll have Jeremy Hodel from the engineering department come in with some solutions and some findings. So we really appreciate you spending time with us today, and I think you're going to enjoy it. So why depth? Why is it important? Is it important? Is it an afterthought? Is depth just something you react to the first day you go to the field? Is depth something that concerns you with your crops? You know, in the audience, we have soybean growers, we have corn growers, we have sugar beet growers, we have cotton growers, we have all the above. And depth is going to impact all those crops differently, not so much when you get it right, but when you get it wrong. We'll explore the severe penalties of when you're wrong on depth and when you miss moisture. Now, the reason that we can have a depth conversation and the why it's important at this point in, in time is because we have researched and dug plants and looked at emergence on all the kind of ground, many different, kind, many different soil types, many different moisture environments. I love this example, this picture that how don't you wish you had that when you went to the field? I think we all wish we had a, an army going behind us and digging seeds. Hey, am I at the right place? How's, how's everything look back there? Eyes in the trench. Now, I will tell you that the only reason we can have a depth conversation is because we've tackled a lot of the hurdles that existed previously. And what I mean by that is that precision planning for the last decade, we have dealt with the singulation issue. We've dealt with the spacing issues. We've worked out how to get a seed every time at the right place. And then downforce and how to keep a downforce control and how to keep a row unit in the ground and how to close it. And what we find is there's still room to improve. And we found one of those areas with depth, and that's why I'm really excited to kind of share this information with you. So we have to get educated as a group and understand the conversation and be willing to have the conversation. It starts here. Depth control is not downforce control. The reason I bring this up and you're like, of course it's not, Matt. I know that. The general idea is that you all know that. What I find with having conversations is, we throw depth and downforce into this little box and it lives there together. And we need to separate it out. Depth control is the act of setting a stop. Downforce control is actually controlling a row unit to that stop. Two very different things that we need to understand. And it's okay, we do understand it, but it's one of those fine details that maybe doesn't isn't so important until I ask this question. Now, I'm not Steve Harvey, and this isn't the family feud, and I'm not going to say, we pulled 100 growers, and they said, but that's what this feels like, because what happens when I ask, what depth are you at? Every single one of those answers from that survey come back with one word, about. Something that's amazing that we might not understand is there is not an about setting on a planner. <laughs> now, I use this picture intentionally, and the reason I do it is you can see the rust and the wear. And he changed depth. A lot of times, when I look at that shank, there's one rust spot. So this guy was looking for the answer. He was environment changing the environment that existed. But I don't still don't see an about on there. Or is there? Status quo. All right, let's we're going to talk a little bit about this today too because we've got to understand why do we resist this this hard? Why is there resistance to depth? We've broke it down into three three kind of pillars. Information or lack of knowledge or lack of, 
and inconvenience, complexity, or lack of time. Those are the three big obstacles that stand in your way of trying to overcome the depth hurdle. All right? The information looks like, well, you know, I really don't know where to measure depth. Is it directly above the sea? Do I go to the left of the trench, right? I don't know that. And, and a lack of information leads to indecision. And indecision is one of the worst feelings in the world. And I've been there. You're in that field and you say to yourself, no one else is responsible for this decision but me. Or worse yet, if I make a bad decision, dad is going to kill me. Knowledge. So if I have the information, knowledge would be the ability to react and change because of that information. And because we lack knowledge and lack information, it kind of feeds into itself right there. I don't know if I'm doing it right or wrong. I just, this is what I do. I've never experienced a catastrophic failure at two inches. It feels like a safety button, almost like insurance. I think I'm going to keep planting at two inches. I dug in the first field. I found a little bit of moisture. I didn't dig the second time. And as I changed soil, as I changed soil types and went across that acres, I definitely didn't redig. How much moisture is enough? Below the moisture line or at the moisture line? 30% chance of rain tomorrow. That's the conversation going on in our heads right now, right? That is one of the resistance to depth change because if I do something, I could be wrong, but doing nothing just feels safe. Inconvenience or the complexity of the adjustment. You got to get out and change for the field conditions. I got to dig once, right? No, you got to dig in every field. Oh, by the way, you got to change all 24 rows. Yeah, but I only got to change it once, right? Doesn't the equipment wear? I mean, I plant a lot of acres with this planter. They're all going to be the same, right? You know, mechanically, is my planter sound enough to react to a small depth change? I can't remember the last time I replaced parts. These are all parts of the conversation that we need to be willing to have in order to get this depth thing figured out, okay? So come along with me here. So I'll give you guys some really good advice. Set up and do a block test for your planner. It's a manual depth calibration. It's very simple. You put a block under a gauge wheel, lower the planner, and measure. Then make an adjustment to your mechanical depth setting so that they all line up. All right, this is something we should all do. You are going to have variance row to row to row. All right, five minutes per row. It's a pain, but in order to master depth, we first have to take this out of the equation. Road row variances exist, and it is costly. Mechanical variation exists. The purpose of this slide here is that if I'm a corn grower, I probably feel like as long as I'm in warm soil conditions, missing depth by a quarter inch might not be the end of the world. To a cotton and sugar beet guy, a quarter inch on a three-quarter inch plant of crop is devastating. So we have to know what's happening on that planter if we really want to hit these optimal things. And why calibrate? As we go out and we plant, if we have mechanical variation, we will see emergence issues. All right, this happens. But it's something, it's a world we don't have to live in. This is something that we can overcome. So why calibrate? Because it costs you money. Why not calibrate? Because it costs you time, I know. You know, the expectation in reality, I like this slide. No one wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to fail miserably. Nobody goes to the field and says, let's plant this field and do a horrible job so we get to do it again. It doesn't happen, does it? Right? The expectation is that we're going to plant 400 bushel corn every time we go to the field. That's going to be the greatest field of cotton I've ever raised. But the reality is you are a much better farmer at 8 a.m., than you are at 3 a.m. And that's just the reality after you have a long day. So we need to set ourselves up to understand that even though we have good intentions, reality sets in sometimes and can really haunt us. So I wanna, I'm not picking on you, but that's the real, the real deal. Why is it critical? So this picture right here, we're showing a planter in an 80 acre field, all right? So here's what I will tell you. The, the, for, the, for the example that we're gonna use today, we're planting 32,000 seeds an acre. Or an acre. So 32 pop, it's a cornfield, 
all right? And in that cornfield, I'm going to plant 32,000 population, 80 acres. So I'm going to put somewhere around 2.56 million seeds in the ground. You guys with me so far? So here's what I want everybody to do. Does depth cost me money? Is there depth variance? Is there money to be made by changing depth on my farm? So here's what I want you guys to do. I want you to go into that 80 acre field this spring and I want you to plant five acres at one and a half inches. I want five acres an inch and three quarters, five acres at two. Go all the way up to however depth you want to go. Two and a half, three, I'm fine with. Try it. Five acres per depth. Wait, what do you mean you don't want to do that? Crazy. All right, so hold on a second. I don't want to run it, but if you don't man do a mechanical variation check or a block check on your planter, aren't you already doing it? In this slide, in this example, each row plants five acres of that field. And if I have not taken the mechanical variation out and done the block test, and I'm wrong, you've got a five acre plot. The difference is if you do it my way, at least you'll have it in blocks where you can harvest it and take it to yield. If you do it your way and not calibrate, what you're gonna end up with is the head blending that average out so you'll never know where the loss was unless you get out and walk it. All right, so it is critical. I mean, the question really is how many seeds reach the depth that you wanted? Okay, so somebody might be thinking, okay, at this point you got me, I will do the block test, I will calibrate my row units. Bad news is, I still don't know where to plant. Which brings us to the most common misconception involving planting depth. There is no one size fits all or one depth that fits every environment and every situation. For our purposes here, I'll use the example of t-shirts. We're so thankful to have 10,000 of you going to be enjoying this and this content and being a part of this. And if I was going to give every single person here and that's viewing this virtually a t-shirt, I would look at this chart. This is the average t-shirt size based off sales. And what that tells me is my best chance of getting the most people to have a shirt that they fits well is to order everyone a large, which means that 30% of you would have a shirt that fits great. It feels good. It fits good. But 70% of you are going to have a shirt that doesn't fit quite so well. Some of us might have a shirt that doesn't even come close to fitting. That's the idea behind depth. If we play the numbers, large shirt, that's the best way to go. I'm going to get more people a shirt that fits. But the reality is that isn't going to work for everyone all the time. Now take a look at this slide. Here's the example we're going to use. Someone on that stage is wearing the correct size shirt, and two guys, not so much. I'll let that one sink in for a minute. But that's what we're doing. Right? We're choosing one thing. Jeremy Hodel looks like he's wearing a tent or a boating sail. I don't know what's going on with Webster. He might be trying to imitate me a little bit. Let's go forward. The probability of winning a random plot, the same idea. All right. If I just choose and I'm going to plant at one depth setting my crop, here are the winners or the probability of winning across all the acres, all the plots that we've done. And you'll see somewhere around two inches is going to win. In fact, if you take this data and go a little bit further, 21% of the time a two-inch planting depth won the plot. That is great news. It is the most common depth to win a yield plot. The bad news is it's wrong 79% of the time. 79% of the time. So if you roll into any field, random anywhere, and you go in and you plant a crop at two inches, there is a great probability that you're probably missed optimum yield with that depth setting. Simplify it a little bit more. Here's the Agco crop tour plot data. I think this is five years, 10 states, 23 sites. I think when you do the math and add all this up, and I'll leave this up here for just a second, I've simplified the chart. I took out all the confusing numbers, and all I did was say, which depth won? I feel really confident 
that based on environmental conditions that I can tell you what depth you should have planted your crop at at the end of the season when we harvest. Isn't that scary? Now think through this. Farmers today live in a world where they give up yield for convenience and they do it daily. Quote by Matt Bennett. I always wondered what it would feel like to have my name and a quote of mine being used on stage. Actually doesn't really feel any different. But, but the point I'm trying to make is, do we do something in our lives that necessarily means adds yield or makes things better, but it makes it convenient and we do it? Right? The, you know it's not the best thing to do, but you do it anyway might be part of that process. You know, we've got to be careful because sometimes we might end up with those seven most expensive words in the English language as if we've always done it this way, right? I've had numerous conversations and one that I will just share with you guys, and I love this story. But along the lines of this conversation, the farmer response was, if I wanted to make more money, I'd deliver pizzas on the weekend. He said, the fact is, Money is not my limiting thing, it's time. The reality for most of us in the audience today is that the commodity of time is sometimes worth more than the commodity that you produce. And that micromanaging or managing depth on the planner isn't worth the cost of the time it's going to take to do it. There's other places we do it too. Central fill planters. I love them. I also hate them. If they're done right, I love them. But if you get out when it's too wet, you, it costs you money. There's not a good yield argument to it, especially in wet conditions. But man, can I fill up fast. Man, do I need less labor to do it. Man, can I cover more acres than if I have to put a bag or tend every single row individually. Okay. The expectation is that we will have plenty of time, but the, we absolutely need more, all right? So the conversation goes something like this. I've got these issues, and I'm unwilling to change. I have a resistance to make a change because it's hard. Well, we've heard you. You need access to better information. We need to be able to change depth effortlessly with speed. You need to be able to adjust to the proper depth in the field in the real-time conditions. You need data and information so that I can hit optimal yield numbers at a much higher rate than 21%. Or I don't want to be wrong 79% of the time. You need to be able to do it from the tractor seat. You need to know that each row is planting the same depth. You need to know the exact depth you're planting at. Simply put, you have requested simple confidence with convenience. I'm excited. I get to hand the presentation over to Jeremy Hodel, and he's going to take you on a brand new path and a solution to some of the problems we spent time with. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Who doesn't want to have their cake and eat it too, right? But, you know, in reality, there's a lot of products out there whose sole purpose is to make your life easier. Take power windows, for example. They're purely designed for laziness, nothing more. They're no better at rolling windows up than you are. And hey, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Those can be good products. Or here's my latest favorite. My wife got me one of these for Christmas. It's called the Ab Hanser. Yeah, you strap this baby on, get a six pack in seconds. That's right, I'll never have to go to the gym again. And don't forget, it's recommended by pseudo athletes, so you really gotta try it. But in all seriousness, the great products are the ones that, yes, they make the task easier, but they also do a better job. I think Auto Steer is a really good example of this. Great product, loved by everyone. What makes it so popular? I know, I know what everybody's thinking. How else would we watch Netflix while we're running the Ripper? Of course, it makes your life easy, but it's not just a convenience tool. Think about all the ways auto steer has changed agriculture. 
Auto Steer has made tillage way more efficient, minimizing wasted overlaps and making the transitions on the ends much smoother. It makes strip till possible, which has really transformed land management for a lot of farms. And it makes for perfect spacing, even on rows in between different passes. And it allows for field work to continue on around the clock. So in so many ways, Auto Steer is much more than a convenience product. And look, I know I'm gonna offend some people when I say this, but let's face it. <laughs> the machine is actually a lot better at steering than you are. So in the same way, Smart Depth is designed, yes, to make your life easier, to make depth management easier. But it also enables you to make better depth management decisions. So to begin with, join me in the shop and we'll take a look at the calibration process. And then from there, we'll go to the field and experience Smart Depth in action. Let's start with calibration. Calibrating depth is something everybody ought to be doing, but <laughs> Let's face it, many of us don't. It can be a pain. It can be time consuming. You've got a lot of things to get done before the planner is ready to go to the field in the spring. And this is one of those things that can fall off the end of the list. The good news is now with Smart Depth, there's an app for that. With the push of a button, Smart Depth will quickly and automatically calibrate out each row of the planner and zero out any variability that exists from row to row. But simplifying the process is not where it ends. Unlike T-handles, Smart Depth is not forced to pick between two discrete positions when the real calibration point ought to be somewhere in between. This provides you with extreme accuracy, which is a big win for planting ultra shallow crops. Furthermore, Smart Depth uses its calibration process to determine depth throughout the entire range, so you can have confidence in your setting even when you move away from the calibration point. So let's take a look at the actual process to see how simple it really is. From the tractor with the planter raised, I'll initiate the calibration. In this part of the process, the actuators are trying to find the minimum and maximum depth that they can achieve. They're finding the shallowest position they can reach and then turning around and finding the deepest position they can reach. After that step is complete, I then set the planter down on a flat concrete surface until the 2020 what depth I'll be calibrating to. Because it's convenient, I'll be calibrating to inch and a half or the thickness of a two by four. Let's finish the calibration now from the back of the planter. Now, all I have to do is slide the two by fours underneath the gauge wheels and press the button on the Smart Depth actuator. From here, Smart Depth is finding the position of those two by fours. While it's doing that, I can set up the next row and keep working my way down the rest of the planter. After all 16 rows are finished, Let's go back to the cab and check out the results. Take a look at rows 11 and 15. What these numbers are telling us is that if we had planted with both of these rows in the exact same T-handle position, there may have been as much as half an inch difference between the two in the field. But Smart Depth has eliminated that variability and adjusted itself so that you don't have to. Let's talk about operation now. Once again, yes, Smart depth is easy. Yes, you no longer have to get out of the cab and go back behind the planner and adjust 16 T handles to make a single depth change. Yes, you no longer have to go through an iterative and time consuming process of guessing and checking to try to get depth dialed in just the way you want it. But it's not just about tickling your lazy bone. Let's take a closer look at some of the features of the smart depth control and find out why. Smart Depth has three different control modes. The first is a simple manual setting. With the press of a button, you can adjust depth for all rows of your entire planner without ever leaving the cab. Now, before you think this is just a convenience feature, consider all the times when you've had to cut corners because of the heat of the springtime battle. Things never go the way you expect them to. Because of a breakdown, all of your planning gets crammed into this tight window, which is usually after dark, right before the next rain event. So yes, Smart Depth is easy, and it's actually for that very reason, because it's easy, that it enables you to get depth right, even when you're under the gun. So let's think about that after dark scenario again. How do you even know what the right depth is in the first place? When you're digging in the dirt, can you actually see the moisture line after dark? 
It's hard, if not impossible. So this is where the power of Smart Firmer, which enables you to see furrow moisture, and Smart Depth really shines. Smart Firmer makes you aware of your need to change, and Smart Depth enables you to change. But hold on a minute. There's something else here, too. We've all got kids that like to ride along in the tractor with us. Imagine how tempting it is for a seven-year-old to go back there and fiddle around with the position of those T-handles. So just like Smart Firmer lets you see moisture from the cab, Smart Depth lets you see depth from the cab. You can see bar charts moving as you're changing depth right from the screen. Or you can pull up a map and, and look at depth at any point in the entire field. This goes beyond convenience. This is confidence and it's from the cab. The next control option is moisture control. This is where Smart Depth automatically changes depth based on furrow moisture readings from Smart Firmer. Now I know none of you has any variability on your farm, but stick with me for a minute. Who hasn't had a cloudy spot in the field because it got worked up a little too wet? And by the time you go to plant it, the moisture line's three inches deep. Do you really want to plant the entire 80 acres at three inches just to accommodate the 10 or so acres that actually needs to be that deep? Well, either way, you're forced to make some sort of compromise, but not with Smart Depth, though. In moisture control mode, Smart Depth is able to tailor the depth to both zones of the field without compromising in either one. So how does this work? Well, you basically need to specify three depths. Think shallow, medium, and deep. Or in other words, what to do when it's too wet, what to do when it's just right, or what to do when it's too dry. These numbers over here enable you to define what should be considered too wet and too dry. Moisture control mode operates on the simple rule that it will go as shallow as you will let it when there's plenty of moisture, or it will go as deep as you will let it when there's not. Or if it's somewhere in between, it will go to the middle. Remember this, with Smart Depth, you are in the driver's seat. So with moisture control enabled, Smart Depth will automatically adjust depth as you go through the field based on whatever moisture conditions you measure with Smart Firmer. The third control option is prescription mode. So just like with seeding rates, you can define zones based on whatever conditions you want. Smart Depth enables you to create custom zones to manage depth to different settings. So suppose you have a center pivot field and you really ought to be planting the dry corners at a deeper depth because they're not gonna get watered in. Once again, with Smart Depth, there's no need to compromise. All you have to do is import the prescription file and Smart Depth will adjust automatically to those different zones as you go. And with Prescription Editor, you can even adjust the target depth in those zones right here from the 2020. So in summary, we're all drawn to products that make our life easier. Smart Depth is one of those technologies that not only makes depth management easier, but it also helps you manage depth better. Let's go to Jason Webster now, who's had the opportunity to run Smart Depth on his PTI farm in Pontiac for the last couple of years. All right, well thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate that introduction. Today we're gonna talk, we're gonna kinda continue the session that Jeremy and Matt have been focusing on and planning depth. And I wanna take you to the PTI farm and show you what we've done with some of our manual planning depth studies and then kind of get into our experience with smart depth and how we've used it at the research farm. And I guess we'll ask a few questions along the way. Number one, does, does planning depth matter? And probably the resounding question is, should we be changing planting depth in the field to ensure we're planting into moisture? And if that answer is yes, then we have to ask ourselves, well, how do we do this? How do we implement it? on our farm, how easy, how difficult is it? How does this process work? So this is one of our research planters at the PTI farm and you know, we plant you know, about 100 different trials on the farm and no matter what we're testing, we always have to make sure 
that we don't get uneven emergence because that'll skew the data that we're trying to get research from. So every plot, and that's just like you guys at home, when you pull that tractor and planter into a field, you have to set the depth in every single field. We are no different at PTI, but we've got to make sure that seed is planted into moisture so we can give it the, the optimum opportunity for uh, the perfect emergence. Some of you folks may have seen this, this picture in the past, and this really hits, hits home to me. These, this is a picture of two young boys, and, and there's a caption in it that says, hey, you've been farming long. And it hits home to me because as a kid, when we're working on, we were working on the farm, we always had to come in for lunch at noon because grandmother had lunch ready for us. And when I would walk into the house and get cleaned up, I'd go into the house, and she had this picture hanging up on the wall. And so I saw this the other day, and it kind of reminded me. I said, instead of these two, two boys saying, you've been farming long, what if they were actually asking themselves, hey, how deep do you plant? And having a conversation about how each one plants on the farm. And it's no different than all of the, the guests we have at the PTI farm every summer, they come and visit us and we go out in the field and we just have a conversation about agronomy. And I thought I'd share with you some of the, the, the answers that we've gotten, I guess, when we ask farmers, how deep do you normally plant on your farm? And here's some of the answers. Well, one, one grower said, well, it depends on soil moisture, but I usually shoot for about an inch and three quarter deep. Some of you may, may agree with that. Here's another grower, and this one's kind of funny. He says, when it's wet, I plant shallow, and when it's dry, I plant deep. Okay, some of you guys can probably relate to that one. Here's another grower that said, I used to plant at two inches, but this year I shallowed up to an inch and a half, and it's the best stand I've ever had. I guess I'm curious about that. Why did he go from two inches, shallow up to an inch and a half, and why did he get the best stand ever? I'd, I'd love to talk with him some more to see the answers to that. But, you know, it, it kind of varies with the crop that we're planting. Some crops we can get by with planting deeper. Corn, for instance, I do think it's a crop that we can plant deeper and go to the moisture line if we have to. But there's other crops. Some folks would say soybeans, you don't want to plant them as deep. I don't know if I believe in that, but I was always told growing up that soybeans need to be planted shallower. But what about other crops you see on the right of the screen? We've got pelleted sugar beets. We've got cotton. Those are two plants that we definitely are going to plant more shallow than corn. And that's where we need the critical control and accuracy because of the soil moisture line. If we have to plant shallow, are we going to have enough moisture to get this crop up out of the ground? What about soil type? Does that have anything to do with how deep I'm going to plant? You know, the, the good black soil, the mellow soil. How much resistance? You've heard about that today. How much resistance? If I plant deep, you know, a mellow soil is not going to fight me as much as maybe a clay soil you see on the right of the screen here. Now, I plant three inches deep, and that, that crop may not ever come up out of the ground because that tight clay has so much resistance. Let's go back to some more answers that farmers gave me when I asked them, how deep do you plant? Here was one grower that says, I start at two inches, and then I start planting on that first round. I get out and I dig about 20 times, and I'll fine-tune it from there. The biggest problem he says he's had with planting too shallow is it ends up with uneven emergence. And all of us as farmers, I've been farming over 30 years, and I've done this before. I planted too shallow, I didn't get a rain, and I end up with an uneven emergence because I didn't plant the seed into moisture. I'd say a lot of us who have planted numerous seasons, numerous crops have probably done this at least, at least once before. Here's another grower. I plant at least two to two and a half inches and I'll go three if needed. Okay, so he's willing to plant deeper to chase the moisture line. <clears throat> and speaking of moisture line, listen to this grower. The bare minimum for me is an inch and three quarter. I want to see planting depth a half inch below the moisture line. Planting depth is one of the more important decisions I make each year. Let's focus on this one a little bit. Let's talk about it. The moisture line. He said he wants to plant a half inch below the moisture line. Do you guys think that's a crazy idea? I think agronomically that's a very sound idea. But I have a problem with the statement. This grower says he wants to plant a half inch below the moisture line. What if the moisture line changes through the field, though? That's my problem with the statement. This image on the screen is a picture of soil moisture. And we, we captured this, this data 
through a research product called Smart Knife, where we can actually record soil moisture at various depths in the soil profile. You'll see the purple triangle on the left side of the screen. Right now, that triangle indicates that we are at 1.25 inches, an inch and a quarter deep. And look at all the red on the screen. That's a furrow moisture reading of about 10. Dry soil, that's in an inch and a quarter. And as we talk about moisture lines moving in the field, I want to show you an animation of what happens as we look at the moisture line as we go to depths of an inch and three quarter. The purple triangle is at an inch and a quarter now, right now. We're going to turn the video on. It's going to go at an inch and three quarter. And I want you to look at what happens to the dry soil here at an inch and a quarter. We're going to turn it on. And look how that dry soil disappears because as we go deeper, we're finding that moisture line. So getting back to what the grower said just a minute ago, he says, I want to plant a half inch below the moisture line. Well, what if there is no moisture line in an inch and a quarter? Okay, we're going to have to move down. And so now the question is, are you going back to your planter, grabbing that T-handle and adjusting depth to make sure you're a half inch below the moisture line if the moisture line is moving past the pass through the field? I doubt that you're changing it past the pass, or even better yet, you get in the middle of the field, are you stopping the tractor and planter to go back to change your depth? I don't think it's happening. Agronomically, it's sound. I want to plant a half inch below the moisture line, but we're not changing depth when the moisture line changes in the field. That's the part that we're missing. Let's go to the PTI farm. We've been on the PTI farm for three years, 18, 19, and 20, and every year's been different. We look at soil moisture in 2018. You see it on the screen here, represented by the red circles. Our moisture line was right at two inches, and that was our optimum plant depth. 2019, totally different. We'll talk about this more here in a minute. We had to drive down planting depths to three inches to get to that moisture line. This past year in, in uh, 2020, we were back up to that two inches, but it changes based on furrow moisture. Here's what we're doing. We've got Smart Firmer going to work for us. We're planting along and in real time, Smart Firmer is in the trench, in the furrow, where we pl we're planting that seed and it's showing us where the moisture line is at. Where we're planting, do we have moisture? Here's a shot of it. Right now you're seeing about 40% moisture, which is very good. That's plenty of moisture. But what happens when we get furrow moisture values that crash? Now all of a sudden you see the numbers go down to 14 to 15%. That's saying that we're planting in dry dirt. So now we've got to make a decision. Do we continue planting in dry soil and just hope we get a rain after we plant? Or can we move planting depth to chase that moisture line. That's the decision we have to make as growers. With the 2020 in the cab of the tractor, when we installed Smart Depth on our planter, the, the planter that I use at PTI, and I even use it at our home farm for putting in trials and, and gaining experience with this technology, the one thing I noticed, I sat down in the tractor cab and I'm planting away, and I went to the 2020 to change depth and it, it dawned on me. I said, we've got a button on the monitor that shows us how deep we're planting. We've never had a button on the monitor that shows depth. And not only does it show depth, but I, I, can, I can look at every single row and it'll show me the depth of every row. And I think that's important because I think all of us measure depth differently. You as a grower may, may get down on your hands and knees, get your knife out and start digging and say, well, that's a two inch depth. And I may go down there and say, well, no, I think that's inch and three quarter. Well, we remove all of that variability out of it. We've got a calibrated row unit here where if you want to plant two inches, we go to the 2020 and we tell it, I mean, it'll, it'll do, do two inches. It's all calibrated and we can find out every row is planting that depth that we, um, that we want it to. And see, we're using Smart Firmer to report to us in the furrow to tell us where moisture's at and then I can go to Smart Depth and we can move depth. We can do it manually or we can do it automatically, all ensuring that seed's planted into moisture. I want to take you back to 2018. 18 is the first year we ever had furrow moisture values um, coming from Smart Firm around the planter. Back in 18, seems like a long time ago. But that year, the green bar in the middle of this graph represents, um, it, it's, this is our manual planting depth study, but two inches was the highest yield. And there's something happened in this trial that I thought was very interesting and I'd never thought of it and I've never been told this before. But here's what happened. The green line that goes left and right at the top of this graph, that's furrow moisture. And we never got under 35% furrow moisture anywhere, you know, in any of these planting depths, which signifies we had good moisture from shallow to deep planting. 
my optimum planting depth was two inches. And here's where it got interesting. No one has ever told me that if I have adequate soil moisture and I plant too deep, it's going to cost me X amount of yield. My father, my grandfather, as I was growing up and they were teaching me how to farm, they never ever told me that. They were never told either. I get into college and I'm studying agronomy. No professor ever told me this. We know what the furrow moisture is and the value and we're saying that if you have adequate moisture, there's no need to plant too deep. That resistance factor is going to be there. It's gonna take longer time to get that crop up out of the ground and it's gonna cost yield. This is the first time I saw this. I've been farming for over 30 years and in 2018, I saw this for the first time. Let's go to the next year, 2019, totally different year. You look at this data and it says three inches was the optimum planting depth. And guys, I'm telling you, I hate seed companies and I hate research companies that'll do a planting depth study and they show you a graph that looks like this. Because a farmer could take this data and say, well, well, these guys are saying that three inches is the best, best depth. I'm gonna go do that on my farm. Well, there's no data here to support why this happened. But we do have data inside this, and I want to share it with you to show you how furrow moisture and depth actually worked very well for us at the PTI farm. Now, I'm just going to look at the two inch, two and a half, and three inch planting depths of this manual planting depth study. So we dive in here. Now, you remember the quote from the one grower that we talked about earlier? He says, I, I start planting at two inches and I adjust from there. I get out and dig about 20 times and I adjust. Well, that's kind of what we're doing in this scenario. The, the, the orange bar there on the left, we're at two inches. Smart farmer's working for us and it says, hey, you're at 18% furrow moisture. You've got some dry soil. What do you want to do? And so I'm in the tractor, I'm, in the, I'm, I'm planting, and I said, well, wait a minute, that's too dry. I know I'm at two inches. Let's adjust. Let's go try to chase that moisture line. Do we get out of the, the tractor and go grab the T-handle on the planter to adjust the depth? Nope. We don't have these anymore. We've taken every single one of them off the planter, and we're running smart depth. We can adjust depth in the cab while we're planting on the fly. We don't have to stop. And so I go to the 2020, and again, it's got the button on the monitor that tells me how deep I'm planting. I hit that button, and it says, you're planting at two inches right now, but you're at 18% moisture, right? What do you want to do? I said, well, I think I want to go deeper. I've got a setting in here. This is a manual setting right here. And I can go to two and a half inches. I press that button. Smart depth moves the depth for me automatically while I'm planting. Let's go back to the field. Smart firmer says, hey, all right, we're at two and a half inches. Now, furrow moisture is a little better. You're up to 27 it's still not that 32, 33% that we're shooting for. I'm still a little too dry, so what do you want to do? Now, I didn't know it at the time, but look at the yield difference from two to two and a half inches. Okay, I'm getting a yield response there. I didn't know it at the time, but we did get it. But we're still 27% furrow moisture, still too dry. What am I going to do? I made the decision. I said, let's go deeper. I go to the 2020, press my depth button, and I said, let's go three inches, a half inch deeper. Smart depth moves the depth of every single row. We go back to the field, finally, we're over that 33% that we're looking for. We're at 38% moisture, and look at my yield. It just kept going up with it. We chased the moisture line, got that seed into moisture to make sure we can get every plant up, and it equated to more bushels. How many? Just from two inches to three inches. That's 7.8 bushel to the acre. You take that times the price of corn, and guys, that's almost $30 an acre just with an inch. Moving an inch. That was 2019. Let's go to 2020, this past year. Our optimum planting depth was two inches, but this is all manual, okay? Two inches was our optimum plant depth. We went too shallow. We ran out of moisture. We're losing 11. Actually, we planted it an inch deep. I mean, that's like drip on corn on top of the ground. I don't think any of you would do that, but that was over a 35 bushel yield loss. How about on the deep side? Well, over two inches. I, I lost less than a bushel going to two and a half. Um, two bushel at, at three inches. I, I got to three and a half and that's where significant yield loss was happening. But let's look at furrow moisture. Again, this is 2020. Why was two inches the optimum plant depth? That's where we finally reached 32.8% furrow moisture. Again, that's the number we're looking for. Right in there, 33% is what I usually say. We go shallower at an inch and a half. I'm down to 24. Seems to be real that we would have yield loss there. Not enough moisture. And then an inch. Remember, we were losing over 35 bushel to the acre. But I'm sitting at 19% moisture. I've got corn sitting in dry dirt. Here's the real exciting data from this study in 2020. We went from all manual planting depth, you know, fixed planting depth, 
from an inch to three and a half inches. I told you two, inch, two inches was our best. I went into autom automated mode. Okay, I've got smart firmer telling me the moisture value. I've got smart depth moving to the parameters, the boundaries I set it to, and it actually beat my fixed optimum depth by almost six bushel. That to me is exciting because I can let it go automatic. I don't have to go manual. I don't want to go manual. I can't react fast enough. I don't have the sensing ability to do it, do it fast enough. Here with Smart Firmer and Smart Depth, it can do it for me, and it did a better job than my manual settings. So here's what we're doing. We're measuring. We're letting Smart Firmer show us that furrow moisture, and then we'll use the 2020 in Smart Depth to react and chase that moisture line to make sure every seed has good seed to soil contact in moisture. You know, in this system, this measuring, reacting, and control is just like you in the tractor cab, planting away and having all of these precision planting white shirts digging behind you, telling you whether you're, you're, you're planting into moisture, giving you a thumbs up, saying you're doing a good job, keep it up. But then in other areas of the field, it may be, hey, thumbs down, we need, to, we need to change here. You're not planting into moisture. We need to react. That's what the system is kind of like. But thank you very much. I'm going to turn it back over to Matt so he can summarize the session. Thank you, Jason Webster. A lot of good information there. Hey, we've had a good time, right? I started out and I kind of introduced some of the reasons why we're resistant to change when it comes to depth management. Jeremy Hodel came in and talked a little bit about possible solutions and ways you can gather the information. And then Webster shared some real life scenarios from the farm and what we're seeing. You know, in my session, you know, gave you the overall picture, maybe some good reasons why we should change, right? For some people in the audience, you're gonna resonate with the fact that if I pick a single setting and I stay with it, I'll be right 21% of the time. Others in the audience might be dwelling on the fact that they're wrong 79% of the time. I hope that through the information that you've gained that we can move that 21 up quite a bit. That we understand that there's a place we can live. Are we going to be right 100% of the time? Statistically, it's not possible. But we can definitely be right way more often. A new way does exist, right? And these fine fractions of time right? These little fractions of changing can mean a big difference. You know, it reminds me of a story. So on the slide, you guys can see right now, there's a picture of a local boy by the name of Jim Tomey, Major League Baseball player, or should, what I should say is Major League Baseball Hall of Famer, Jim Tomey. Local boy, Peoria area. You know, Major League Baseball has a Hall of Fame. For those of you in the audience who don't know what baseball is, you know, it's a, it's a sport, white ball, red stitches, funny mitt, America's pastime, maybe you heard of it, right? And you know they have a Hall of Fame. So Hall of Fame, they've been playing baseball for over 100 years, and they have a Hall of Fame, and that is where the elite of the elite, because you're elite if you're in Major League Baseball. 14 million kids play Little League Baseball every year in the world. 750 people in Major League Baseball. So it's pretty elite. Your chances of being a pro baseball player are kind of like hitting the lottery. It's a big number. I won't bore you with it, but the chances are not high. But I feel like a Major League Baseball Hall of Famer is this huge difference between him, uh, that player, and someone that plays baseball in the Major Leagues right now today. So I thought about this. So we went through some of it and, and kind of pulled out some of the numbers. So what we found is there's 333 people in the Baseball Hall of Fame. And by the time you take out executives, umpires, managers, and pitchers, you're left with 181 people that swung a bat for a living. Isn't that amazing? Out of 19,000 possible people, 181. And the batting average, that's what I was going to focus on. The average batting average of a Hall of Fame baseball player is 303. The Hall of Fame batting average. Oh, so I thought, okay, what is an average baseball player? Maybe it's the guy that plays second base at Toronto. All right? 
The only difference is I don't know this guy's name, and of course I know who Babe Ruth and Jim Tomey are, Hall of Famers. The average batting average in Major League Baseball is 250. Big difference, right? 250 to 303. That's what I thought too until I started doing some of the statistical analysis. What I found out is an average baseball player has 550 at bats in a season. And 550 at bats to bat 250, they have somewhere around 137 hits. And someone that bats 303 has 29 more hits. That's not that big a deal over the course of a season. Or one hit every 18 at bats. One more hit every 18 at bats. The point I'm trying to make here is the difference between a Hall of Famer and batting average and someone that's hugely successful. If you play second base for Toronto and I don't know your name, you probably have a good living. You probably have a nice house and drive fast cars. You're successful. You're in Major League Baseball but no one's going to buy your jersey. Now think about this. If you're one of the 10,000 farmers that's watching this video, you're in the big leagues. You are doing the little things to be great. And this, these fine-tuning, the one more hit, every 18 at bats is what we're talking about when we talk about depth management. You can be hugely successful and miss this. But how can I be Hall of Famer? How can I get that much better? And that's the point we're trying to make with this. Justin McMenemy showed you smart from earlier today. He told you that it's a tool that helps solve the information problem. Smart firmer gather, gathers the information through the field. It's essential for making the right decision. It's giving you a view of the trench that you've never had. It feeds into the information that allows you to make knowledgeable decisions on how to change. Jason gave us insights on how to, how to better manage depth decisions. Jeremy gave us tools to solve the convenience problem, which enables you to manage depth more easily and not be in that 79% wrong. We feel like we've given you enough information that when you start stacking this together, you're now empowered to be a Hall of Famer, a Hall of Fame farmer. Thank you for your time. We enjoyed having you. Enjoy the rest of Winter Conference. And thank you for being a part of this session.